Part 1. You are going to hear a conversation between a host family and an accommodation officer for international students. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Accommodation office, Tom speaking. How may I help you? Yes, hi. Uh, my name's Margaret Williams. Oh, hi. Um, I understand that you're looking for host families for international students. Yes, we're always looking for suitable families, as we have a lot of demand at the moment. How did you hear about us? Um, from a friend, Mrs Dalton, who's already with your agency. We live in the same street as her in Maltby. Ah, yes, I know who you mean. You're quite close to several of our schools. And I just wanted to ask some questions about registering with you. No problem. OK, can you tell me how we go about becoming a host family with you? Well, once a family first approaches us, we like to make a preliminary visit to the home, have an informal chat and discuss all the registration details first. That sounds great. Do we need to make an application at this stage? No, we like to come and visit you first and provided we're then both happy after the preliminary chat, we usually begin the registration process there and then and you can complete it and send it in by email. What about references and things like that? Mm, if the application for registration is submitted and accepted, we need to do some background checks first of all and we like to have at least two references from families or professional people. We'd only do these if you made a definite commitment to proceed. OK. We think it's better to check that a family's clear about what is involved in the whole process. Then we can begin the application process. How long does the process take? It depends, but it's usually a few weeks, unless there are any delays. Once everything is agreed, we match students with suitable families at the beginning of a term and usually at the beginning of the academic year in September. That all sounds reasonable. Can I ask how many students you were thinking of hosting? We thought that we would like to take two to start with. We have two daughters aged 14 and 15, so we'd like two students around a similar age. That would be ideal. It's easier then for them to strike up a friendship. That shouldn't be a problem. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Obviously, we have to look at things like how far the host family home is from schools we cover, access to libraries, whether you have Wi-Fi, access to public transport and the neighbourhood in general. OK. That sounds very reasonable. I think we'd like to proceed. OK, that's good. We could actually do a preliminary visit at the end of this week, Thursday morning or Friday afternoon or any time on Saturday and have a more detailed chat and start the application process, if appropriate. OK. We're both free on Friday afternoon. That'd be fine. Can I have the number of your house? It's 53. 53. And two more things. Could I take a mobile number? Yes, it's 08977 392251. 392251. Yes, that's right. And your email address? It's maw973 at maltby.co.uk. OK. I'll email you the confirmation of the meeting and shall we say 2 p.m.? Yes. That, that is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a speech from the director of the museum talking about the annual competition. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Welcome. My name's Darren Timpson, and I'm the director of the Penwood Museum. And I'm here to announce the winners of our annual competition, which, as usual, runs in conjunction with our summer exhibition. Each year, the competition has a specific theme, and the theme we chose for this year's competition is the use of technology to improve links between the local community and the museum. Entrants could choose from a selection of the museum's artefacts to create exhibits on this topic. We've had loads of entries from secondary schools, which is important as more local teenagers are getting involved. I just want to give you some background information about this year's competition. The competition was open to groups of young people from institutions like schools and youth clubs who were aged between 15 and 19 on the final entry date for the competition, which was the 13th of May. While preparing their competition entry, the competitors were allowed to use the educational facilities at the museum and to look for help from local sponsors, but were not allowed to buy any equipment. We then had seven shortlisted exhibits, which visitors to the museum of all ages were allowed to vote on for the first three places. The prize-winning exhibits are having a big impact on Penwood Museum attendances, which have risen by up to 45% since the summer show opened. The first prize in this year's competition has been won by a group of seven young people who chose various exhibits from the museum's collection of equipment from the 1950s to the 1970s. They arranged them with modern versions and then recorded their own reactions and comments to the exhibits. They then did the same with the comments made by visitors aged 65 and over. And so can we have a round of applause for the winners from Tigers Community Centre who called their entry Technology now and then. And the second prize winners are Tabard High School. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Before we have some refreshments, I'd like to draw your attention to some of the video commentaries on the winning exhibit, which have been left by members of the public and which are very moving and some very funny. I particularly liked seeing the recording of the reaction of several people when they talked about an early wooden frame TV from their childhood. They remembered their first TV, which they thought still fitted in with today's trends. They remembered how they would sometimes all go round to someone's house to watch TV as a special treat. But they thought the modern TV screen, with the remote, was much easier to watch. As for the collection of old radios, it has to be seen. They are really huge old wooden frame radios in perfect working order and in perfect condition. Some teenagers' reactions to the radios were very funny. They couldn't believe how big they were. And the older visitors, all of whom used to have one, said they liked them. 
But they also thought they were too big to fit into living rooms these days. A few more items worth looking at from the display are old kitchen items. Young people thought the cooker from the 1950s looked funny alongside the latest microwaves. Nearly all interviewees who were aged 65 and over used microwave ovens, which they thought were much handier. Seeing old typewriters on display next to slim laptops made them look weird and cumbersome. All those who were 65 and over preferred the laptops, which they thought were thrilling. The other electronic items on display were a collection of old and fairly recent cameras. They also thought the older cameras were well made and better than the newer ones. I'd like to thank you all for coming and please give a round of applause for all the entrants to the competition. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between a tutor and two students about their presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. OK, if you want, we've got some time left for some feedback on your joint presentation today. Yeah, we can do it now while it's fresh in our minds, if it's OK with Francesca. It's OK with me. So, Francesca, how do you think it went? Well, um, I was really happy with it, actually, but I'm glad it's over. I think the main advantage of doing the presentation was that we both learned quite a lot about training and skills development for the workplace and how they improve people's opportunities in life, especially their job prospects. And we learned a lot from actually delivering the presentation as well, which is really useful for the future. Yeah, that was important too. Mm, as I said, I was pleased with it, but if I had to do it all over again... I'd change a few things. Like what, for instance? Well, um, the first thing I'd do is work on the pace of the talk and make the delivery slower. And I'd keep a clock in front of me so that I was aware of the speed. And, and the next thing is, um, the length of the talk. I'd make the presentation time 15 minutes for each of us, because I think 10 minutes each was much too short. If we had given ourselves more time, it would have flowed better. Yes, I agree. I thought the timing was a bit tight. I'd say maybe even 30 minutes each. Mm, 30 minutes might have been a bit long for both you and the audience. Maybe you're right. 15 minutes each would probably have been better. And the next thing is the order of the data. I thought the sequence was bad. It could have been a lot better. Yes. If I had to give some particular advice, I'd say you needed to give yourselves a run-through once or twice using the equipment just to see what it's like. Doing it without preparation like that's not that easy. No, definitely not. And another thing for me is that we forgot to give out the handouts with the copies of our slides on them for people to take notes. I should have given them out before we started. And one final thing I do is I check that everyone could see the screen properly. 
Mm, I'd make sure the arrangement of the chairs in the room made it easy for everyone to see. And Jack, what about you? How did you feel about it all? Well, uh, I agree with Francesca. Yeah, in everything she said. It's very difficult to make the delivery smooth. If, when I do it again, I'll definitely spend more time practicing to make it run more smoothly. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. But would you add anything to what Francesca said? Um, perhaps I'd try to pack less information into the time given. Uh, I thought at first it would be the opposite. Uh, I was afraid that we'd end up looking foolish. And also, I think I'd spend less time on the information gathering phase, because unless time is devoted to practicing, it'll not be possible to give a good performance. Yeah, I think I'd agree. Anything else? Yeah, I get very nervous when I speak in front of people. If I did it again, I'd make sure I practiced speaking out loud and projecting my voice. I think the key for me is learning to steady my nerves. But you were very calm. <laughs> Not inside, I wasn't. Well, it didn't show. I think you need the nerves to keep you going. But maybe try to take your mind off it beforehand by exercising or something. Is that everything? Yeah. Okay. Well, you'll be pleased to know the feedback from the class questionnaires was that the presentation was enjoyable, so well done. I have to say that I agree with them. Oh, <laughs> thanks. I'll make a copy for both of you of the questionnaires if you want. And if and when you do give a talk again, you can keep them to refer to. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a part of a lecture about history of money. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. As we continue our series on customs and traditions that influence the values and principles of all societies in the world, today we're going to talk about money. It is easy to think of money as just an economic tool in the world of finance, but it also has a social and psychological dimension. It is woven into the fabric of our society and thinking, and as such has, through history, despite people's criticism of its pursuit, helped lay down the standards and the ethics that govern modern society. First of all, to look at the history of money, we need to ask ourselves what money is. Money is, in fact, an invention of the human mind, which is made possible because we, as human beings, are able to give value to symbols. And money is one of the most important symbols in all societies, because it represents the value of goods and services. If we accept any object as money, 
say a gold coin or a digital bank account balance, both the user and the wider community have to agree to this. So all the money that we use today has um, not just an economic dimension, but a psychological and a social one as well. Before we look at so-called commodity money with the introduction of coins and representative money, let's go back to the time of bartering. Before money was invented, bartering was the main way to exchange goods. An individual who had something of value, such as some grain, could directly exchange the grain for another item, which was seen to have an equivalent value, like a small animal or a tool. The seller of the grain, of course, had to find someone who wanted to buy it, and who could offer in return something the seller wanted to buy. There was no common medium of exchange, such as money, into which both seller and buyer could convert the commodities they wanted to trade. So the first stage in the evolution of money was commodity money. This involved accepting objects or commodities, such as grain or metals or animals, as being inherently valuable, so they could be used as a common standard of measure and unit of exchange. People could accept any of these objects as money because they had inherent use value for every individual, and therefore they would be widely accepted by other people. All metals were accepted because they could be easily converted into precious tools, for instance axes and spades. Metals such as gold and silver also had secondary advantages. They were also easy to identify and visually attractive. Gold, silver, copper, as well as other usable objects such as salt and peppercorns are categorized as commodity money since they combine the attributes both of a usable commodity and a symbol. So people accepted foods and metals as money because they were sure of their value to themselves and to other people. Then came metal coins, which were another step in the evolution from usable commodities such as grains to symbolic forms of money. Metal had a use value of its own, but coins became accepted in trade for their symbolic value. They acted as a standard measure for exchanging other goods and services of value, rather than for the use of the metal they contained. The next stage in the evolution of money is that of representative money. Representative money is symbolic money that is based on useful commodities, such as the warehouse receipts issued by the ancient Egyptian grain banks, and more recent forms of paper currency that were backed by gold or silver. The adoption of representative money was a significant evolution in human consciousness, Psychologically, the individual had to transfer the sense of value from a usable material object to an abstract symbol. Socially, groups of people had to agree on the common usage of the same symbol. The invention of representative money then had a profound effect on the evolution of both money and society. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.